Okay, this is chapter 11. Um, survival analysis and sensor data. And this is an interesting chapter for me because I had, uh, I've done this kind of analysis before, uh, but I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I mean, like <laughs> I had no idea about this sensory and all this kind of stuff. I just kind of like dropped that kind of data out and like, uh, you know, mm. let the thing end, let the, whenever the, whenever, whenever the data ended, I didn't know how to, I, I, re, I wish I had read this chapter before I'd done that kind of analysis. It was in the context of a customer churn and mm -hmm. I don't think it was completely wrong, but still, there's a lot I learned from this chapter that I wish I'd known. So it's a very useful chapter. I will say this, it is, in my opinion, uh, only scratches the surface of this, right? It's kind of like an introduction Ooh. to this topic. And so it, it does hit some things at a higher level and then it kind of just brushes over things and, and which is fine. I'm, that's exactly what it should be, but I'm just preparing you for, for that. Well, you read the chapter, you probably agree or disagree, but... Um, yeah. In any event, so what kind of data is survival data? Uh, survival data is any kind of time to event data. And usually it's a situation where the time is unbounded. So the event could occur some indefinite time in the future. Uh, examples are time from surgery to death, time for a customer uh, to cancel a subscription, um, machine malfunction. Uh, and so we're calling it survival analysis here. It has other names in other fields like reliability analysis, duration analysis, time to event analysis, event history analysis, as uh, stated there. Uh, I will say one thing about these notes. I took the notes that were on the GitHub and I modified them for myself, which is kind of what you're supposed to do. But um, some things in here I may say, oh, this was from the previous cohort. And uh, <laughs> just be aware I saved those things that were in there because I thought they'd be they're useful. In particular, this uh, was from a previous cohort. They recommended this YouTube video series called, it's from this guy called um, Zed Statistics. Let me just copy this URL and put it in the Zoom chat. Where is the Zoom chat? I've lost it. There it is. All right, so this is the URL for that series. I watched the first one. I haven't got around to watching the rest of them, but it seems like it's a good, um, a good series. And it does give some good introduction to this mm -hmm. topic with examples and, and things of that nature. And, you know, the guy's a pretty good presenter too. <laughs> He's pretty good. So this brings us to this topic of sensor data though, right? What happens, this is another thing from the previous car. I love this though. It's like, you, you either die a hero or you live long enough to become right censored. So it's like a stats meme, right? <laughs> and so what does that mean? What does a sensor data mean? Sensor data is data that we don't have. We have a subject, we have a customer, we have a whatever it is, but we don't actually have the event. The day the customer dropped out, the patient dropped out of the study, or the study ended and the person and the event had not happened yet. The person was still alive. Good for him, of course. Um, the customer is still a subscriber, whatever the event might be. And so that's what this graph represents here. It shows six uh, patients, let's say, and the red X's are the event of a death, but the blue um, crossed out sign is the event of the patient dropped out, or in this case, these lines two and three, they, the study ended. So we don't know what happened to those guys. So the data is said to be censored. And that's the key insight for this whole chapter, the key insight that I didn't have any idea about coming into this. So it's kind of a cool concept, I thought um observations this just kind of repeats what i said at the bottom here already said that oh the other thing is the book calls this right censoring because it's on the right of this time graph i presume and there could also be left censoring where the events are we don't know when they started necessarily or we may not know when they started they could be censored as far as the beginning time or interval censoring where in some cases we have events where we don't know where they started and we also don't know where they ended um it's interesting because the left censoring was more the Thing that I was having trouble with in the customer churn thing because sometimes I didn't have data on when the customer joined the, the, mm -hmm. the company as a customer. Left sen right sensing was not really an issue because customers just don't drop out. I mean, that's the thing that it was that is the event. <laughs> so it's interesting. Anyway, so this book, uh, this chapter only talks about right censoring, but again, these are things that you can go out and find out um, uh, for yourself more details. Again, I want to remind you too that while I'm going through these things, I read the book chapter. You guys read the book chapter. I hope. Did you guys read the book chapter? 
Did I ask? You I that? did. Yeah. Is I sort really of yeah. skimmed over this one a little bit um, through the math, but yeah, I read the whole thing. Excellent. Yeah, there's parts that I skimmed over as well, as you'll see when we get toward the end. Uh, any event, the the um, what I decided to do here was kind of inspired by the way the previous cohort had done is I folded in some of the lab into this, in particular the brain cancer lab, just so we had something concrete to look at as we're going through these things. So uh, the brain cancer data is shown here. There's 88 patients that had uh, brain cancer uh, treat surgery, I think it was. Actually, I'm not sure now. I forgot. Was it surgery? Does anyone remember? Well, anyway, they had some kind of treatment. And this is there over here in the far right is the time of the event that they either there's two possibilities for these events They either were censored that is they dropped out of the study or the study ended or they died. And the status uh, integer over here zero one tells you which case it is so a zero they dropped out or the end of the study ended or one zero means they're censored one means they're uncensored that means that this is actually eight nine eight point nine eight days is the actual uh, time of death. And the other columns in this are different predictors, sex, the type of uh, cancer they had, where it was, uh, gross GTV is gross tumor volume, KI is, I forgot what the word is, but anyway, it's, it's some kind of uh, measurement of cognitive ability. If any of you guys have better insights on these things, please feel free to jump in, like I said. Uh, so in this case, there's 35 uh, patients who were uncensored data, that is those patients died before the end of the study or before they left the study for whatever reason. So that's the data we're going to look at. But now that was just an introduction to that data. Let's talk about what we're trying to get out of the data. And one of the key things we'd like to get is this survival function, which is just the probability of surviving up to time t. We're, uh, so uh, mathematically, it's probably the capital T is greater than t, where capital T is this time of death or whatever event. I say I'm going to use the word death a lot, but this could be any event. It doesn't necessarily have to be a death. Maybe it's morbid to me, but that's what the book used. So we're going to keep saying death, but it could also just be in a canceled subscription, which I guess, you know, it's kind of an economic death. I don't know. Any event, I hope that makes sense. So we'd like to be able to estimate this survival function, but we don't observe T, and this is important. We rather we observe, this, observe this variable that they call Y in the book, which is the minimum of T or C, or no, said another way, Y is either T if we observe the death, or it's C, the time of censoring, if the data was censored. So in order to know which you have, you also need this status indicator, which in the lab data was called status. And that tells you, well, one means it was a uncensored data and the Y is actually is T and a zero means it is censored data. And whatever time is in that column is actually just the time that the data was censored and not the time of death, which we don't know. And in R, these pairs are grouped together in an object you'll see used throughout the lab called serve, as survival, I guess, short for. And that makes that groups the two types of two columns together because they go together in the analysis. Right? So then the book talks about, okay, what can we do? We can't, we don't have T, we can't just, I mean, if we had T, if we had nobody was censored, and the study went on long enough that everybody had died. <laughs> Sounds bad. But then we could just estimate S by just counting up how many are alive at one at any given point in the study, right? That would be S of T, pretty easy. So the trick here is instead of looking directly at S, is kind of look at the rates of death. Um, and so the way it's done for this Captain Meyer survival curve is to look at the times of death. Okay, so the book defines these three variables, D sub J the times of death, R sub J, the number of non-censored um, cases, the people at risk, right? So non they're alive, they're not censored, they're there, they are at risk of potentially dying. And then finally, Q is the number that actually die at that time of death. Normally, this is one because each time of death is going to be unique. But depending on the granularity of the data, it could be more than one, like if it's days or months or something, if the time of death is actually a period, for example. And so what you end up looking at then, what you want to look at then is this ratio of RJ minus Q over R, which is just the fraction of those at risk that survived past that time, DK, right? That's all that represents. So Q over R of them died, the fraction died, right? It's pretty straightforward, I thought. Um, and this is just an estimate of this probability that given that you were alive, you guys know that, you know this, obviously, I assume you guys know this notation because it's been used in the book 
quite. I get some, sometimes I get these different books I'm reading uh, confused in my head a little bit, but uh, this just simply means that given that you were alive at time t sub j minus one, you survive up to time, you survive past that time d sub j, okay? So it's conditional probability, which is what we're estimating with this ratio, right? Given that you were alive up to the previous death, you didn't die this time. This death is not you, in other words. And the book shows how to then take the, uh, the thing we're trying to get, S, the survival probability, and decompose it into these elemental pieces in a rel relatively straightforward way using the law of total probability. And the, um, so if you put, if you take that expansion and you plug in this ratio, you get this Kaplan-Meier estimator. I assume I'm pronouncing that right. I'm just making that up, but hopefully that's how you, Kaplan-Meier, anyone have a better, anyone know that, been exposed to this before, know how that's pronounced? I think that's no, right. No, but uh, it sounds right. Good guess. Good, good guess, good guess anyone else, right? Yeah. So that, and I want to just point out one thing. If you know this is a product, but if you take a log, you turn it into a sum, which is you know well-known thing. But the reason I point that out because then I want to make a, a connection between this or this kind of a construction and the construction for the hazard function we're going to look at later. So I just want you to keep that in mind. Okay. So one uh, clarification question. Um, I think I think I have this right. But I just want to make sure for the times. Um, it's all relative to the beginning for that person, the data set, right? Like, or does it depend yes. on what data yes. you're looking at? Yeah. So it's, it's, they don't have to be synchronized in, in time. Um, they should, and, and I think they're only, I think normally we're thinking the time is, is relative to that for that each patient. Yeah. For their start. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or subscriber or whatever. Wasn't there yeah. something? Yeah. Because I could imagine, though, if you're looking at like churn or something, there might be other covariates that that there might be covariates that change over time in terms of their predictive ability or like importance for predicting, um, you know, churn, for instance, like like, you know, economic conditions or, you know, at one point in time might matter or like they're losing out to a competitor, you know, and, you know, like how big the space is in terms of economic, you know, like competition, um, you know, so. No, that's a, so that's a very good point. Um, yeah. I mean, there is a little comment in the book in the, sorry, go ahead. Talk no, you me. go ahead. No, I was done. Yeah. Go I was going to say the book does mention this briefly in section 11.7.2, that sometimes the choice of time scale can be more subtle. Like, in, I think what you said, it kind of echoes that. Like sometimes there may be some other, time scales of things going on. Like you said, oh, I changed my product line. Well, now, how does that fold into this, right? So, yeah. Right, right. And then you wouldn't want to have to like shift everything. I don't know. And then you, yeah. And then you wouldn't want to compare a customer from year one, you know, and how long right. they survive to want someone from year nine, you know, like, um, and how long they survived as a customer, you know? So, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I'm not sure even how you doesn't have to go about doing right. that, but yeah. It doesn't have to be aligned, but then it, it, you know, um, some cases, uh, yeah, you might form. Well, yeah. You can have time dependent covariates and maybe what you could do mm -hmm. is, you know, you would still use elapsed, elapsed time from when they started being a customer, but then you have some time dependent predictor that changes like for each, each one of those places, you have to move the time of the actual event to where it was relative to when that customer started. Right. I mean, you could, you could probably, it seems like that's the start of something you might be able to do there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Cool. Usually right. it's the elapsed time that we're concerned with. Yep. Okay, so the uh, to get one of these curves is actually relatively straightforward in R because there's a survival library and a survival fit function. You just tell it, you know, hey, I, I grouped it. Here's that survive thing I was talking about, right? So we grouped the time and the status together into, this is for that brain uh, cancer data. And then we say, this notation here just means we're just fitting it to only an intercept right so we can get this um curve this is a way of tricking it into giving us the kaplan meyer curve um and yeah there it is that's what it looks like it nicely gives a little air bar too apparently on the estimate now we'd like to kind of do a little better than that well let's start looking at some of the predictors or we can look at the 
sex, male or female, and stratify the curves that way. And then we get two different curves. And at first glance, it does look like, oh, uh, the females survived longer on average. But then we have to ask the statistical question, is, the, is this a significant effect? And for that, there's this log rank test, which I didn't reproduce much in depth about how that works in these charts, but it's easy enough to do with in the, um, in the survival package, you just ask it for this test and it'll give it to you. And it says, oh, the resulting p-value is 0.23. Basically, it just asks the question, is this by chance, what's the probability of this by chance they would be this different given the noise in the data, right? Just like any statistical test. And the details of how that's done is in the book. Well, it's not, I shouldn't say the details, a little more detail is given in the book, but exercise seven really goes, well, really, and I haven't done it yet, by the way, but I know that's what exercise seven is because of the footnote apparently goes into this in more detail if you want to know how it works exactly. Uh, one thing that the previous cohort pointed out was this very nice package. This is not from the text. This is just from the previous cohort that pointed this out. There's another package called serve minor. Um, I don't know what the minor part is, but uh, it produces ggplot uh, level um, curves and simultaneously does the log rank p-value all in one go and makes, uh, I would say, prettier graphics <laughs> for your comparison of the two um survival curves those are nice yeah yeah just point that out okay so that's that so now we know how to like est estimate the survival probability we know how to estimate like for different categories how to like just separately do them but how do we do some kind of regression with this and for that we need to take a little side detour just like the book does into the hazard function uh this thing they call the hazard function which is analogous to this um uh, you know, how many, you know, in the previous case, we said how many survived up to time Q or D, I guess it was, right? Given that they survived up to time D, so K minus one. Well, this is the same thing, but now taken an, as in, uh, in, over an infinitesimal level. And so the hazard function is just defined as a risk of having an event at time T plus delta T, given that you survived up to time T. And it's a derivative, so it's a rate, right? And there's a little note here that says, why do we care about this? Well, it turns out, you know, it turns out that, <laughs> I love those, right? It turns out, it turns out that this is a key for doing uh, modeling soil data as a function of the regressors, covariates, or whatever you want to call it. So, but this raises the question, well, what we want, what happened to S? <laughs> we, we really care about S. And uh, so I just want to talk briefly about how you get from H to S and the first thing you need to look at is yet another rate called the death rate. Now, this is the actual unconditional death rate. What's the probability of the event occurring near T, period, dot? Um, and the reason why we're interested in that, because this kind of helps break up, uh, or I should say F can be broken up, right? Because the probability of an event happening, the event happening at time T is going to be equal to the probability that you survived up to time T, that's S, times this hazard function, the probability you have an event at time uh, T plus delta T given that you survived, right? Just straightforward definition of conditional probability more or less. Um, now the book goes through that in a more rigorous way using Bayes rule, but this is like the intuition for it. This is how I think of it, right? It seems pretty straightforward to me that what's the probability that you, I, there's an event near T? Well, that should be the probability of surviving up to T and then the probability the event actually happens at T plus delta T. Does that make sense? Because that's that's not in the book. That's just I felt that that helped give a little more intuition to the construction that the book does for this formula. Yeah, I'm just reading through what you wrote, but I think it it does make sense. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Could you just hang out here for one second? I just want to read through the what you have. Um, sure. 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 Oh, I can't see. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, did I do something? No, uh, you're good now. You're good now. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's that's that part. But then finally, we want to think about how to relate S and F. And this is to me seem it's like relatively straightforward that if 
F is the instantaneous probability of an event occurring near T, then S, which is the probability of occurring from zero to T, should somehow be, or probably of not occurring from zero to T, should somehow be related to that summing up all those Fs through that, all, that, all that time from zero to T, right? And that's this integral. Uh, so actually I said one minus S because S of T is the probability of surviving. Well, one minus S is the probability the event happens by time T. So the probability of the event happening by time t is 1 minus s, then that should be equal to the sum of all the f's from 0 to t, the integral, right? I'd say sum, but you think, I think of it as a sum, because then summing up over this little delta t is the probability you, that the event happened during each one of those times. And since they're mutually exclusive, it only happens once, you can just add the probabilities in that way. Uh, that's hand wavy, uh, but in exercise 8, you, you're asked to go through that in more detail, in less hand wavy, I presume. And I did work through it here um, for your, you know, viewing pleasure later when I get it put up to the GitHub, but um, it does hold water, <laughs> what I said. So it said another way, the derivative of the survival function with respect to time is just the negative of this, this F, this instantaneous uh, event probability. So the whole point of doing all this, we can put those things together and we can say, finally get to this equation that says that the derivative of the survival function is equal to minus the survival function times the hazard function, or the derivative of the log of the survival function is equal to minus the hazard function. And that's the key, well, I guess the integral, the express that integral form is kind of the key formula you need to be able to do these things because you're going to have a model of some kind for a hazard function, and then in that you're going to need also the survival function. And I, this is one thing I wanted to point out, which I thought was kind of interesting, is if you go back and look at the Kaplan-Meier curve, remember that in that case, I showed that the log of the survival function estimator, right, is equal to the sum of these logs of this um, R minus Q over R thing, which is approximately equal to the sum of minus Q over R for when Q is small compared to R, right? So Q over R, well, that seems, that makes sense because the Q over R is kind of the hazard at time Q. It's the, the hazard, the probability I'm, that I'm gonna have a death. Uh, given that it not, has not died by that time, right? So that's the kind of connection between the, the hazard function approach and the Kaplan-Meier function approach, which I, I, that's an independent thing I, I put in here, not from the book, just because I, I thought they should have some kind of connection. It seems like there is a connection. Mm -hmm. so, so all that is very abstract, I'm sure. So <laughs> I think it's useful to consider a particular case uh, and so that's why I said let's consider a case like constant hazard uh, for example radioactive decay for radioactive decay the probability of an atom decaying at a given time given that it hasn't decayed yet is independent of time it's completely constant that's the definition of that kind of exponential decay and sure enough the survival function is just an exponential uh, the instantaneous probability is also an exponential right so the survival of the time t is e to the minus lambda t. You know this if you took some base, you know, when you took basic science, you learned this, right? So that's kind of what, the, now that gives me an intuition as to what the hazard actually means, you know? Mm -hmm. Sorry, all Ron, right, can so you go back? Why did we do all that? Sorry, what was the minus yeah. f of t again? Minus f of t? Minus, so the DSDT, this? yeah. So this just says that the, the rate of change of your uh, survival function is equal to minus the instantaneous probability of surviving at that time t. Okay, okay. Right? It's a minus because S is survival and F is not survival, F is death, right? Or event probability. That's why the minus okay. sign's in there. I think in the exercise, they actually define one minus F to be capital F, so that this sign thing is less intrusive in your thoughts. <laughs> one way to say it. Okay, so the reason for doing all that is so we can start thinking about regression. We need to, this helps us build the likelihood function, and the book gives us this as the likelihood function, uh, assuming a lot of things about independent the, the different uh, events are independent, um, and. I guess there's some, I can't remember what the, I thought there's some other assumptions that totally escaped my brain just now, but what this says is that for a non-censored data point, the factor is going to, then delta is one, right? So that's H to the one is just H, right? Um, that the 
factor in the likelihood is just H times S, which again is F. So this makes sense, right? So the F of Y is the probability of dying in a tiny interval around Y. So that's the probability of the data, which is what we want for likelihood for that case. And for sensor data, the factor is just the survival. You know, they, all we know is they survived up until time a Y. We don't know anything else beyond that. So that's what we put in for likelihood for those cases. So that's the likelihood function that we're going to use to, you know, we have some parameterized model of the hazard. All you need is the hazard because I showed you how to calculate the survival from the hazard. So you have some parameterized model of the hazard. I mean, I need to make a point. The only reason I went through that detail is because the book doesn't really tell you how, it just says, oh, you can compute S from H. I'm like, well, come on, how do you do it, <laughs> right? Well, it's an exercise, but I put it in here because I thought it was important just to have that intuition of what the connection between S and H is, right? Now we know that S is just, can be computed from H from the cumulative hazard up to that point, right? The log of S is the cumulative hazard up to that point. So uh, integral, in other words. Um, so, so anyway, we could parameterize H in some way and use it in a likelihood model and then fit it by doing maximum likelihood in exercise nine, which I also have not done, but plan to do before next week is looks at this uh, concert hazard example. And then, but then they say, well, we really want to do some kind of regression. That was the whole point of bringing this up. And so we could assume some functional form like they show here where H of T given your uh, predictors X is given by this exponential of a linear regression model, right? It's exponential just so it keeps H positive. Um, and we could use this in a maximum likelihood to estimate the parameters. But they make the point that this is constant in time and really too restrictive for most cases. So they, instead they introduce uh, the sim next simplest possible thing, which is where you add some kind of time dependence outside the multiplying factor called the proportional hazards assumption. So it assumes some separate baseline hazard function dependence, right? Hang on, there's something I was thinking of, what was it? No, oh, I forgot. Anyway, it assumes some, uh, the time dependence is it's just a factor multiplying this uh, exponential of the linear regression, right? So oh, I remember what I want to write down. I'm just making notes of things I got to fix in here. Sorry. So it's important to check this assumption with your data before you start using this kind of partial hazard model. Um, so for a qualitative feature, you can do what we did with the sex for the brain cancer. You can plot the log hazard function for each level of the feature. If it's a quantitative feature, the book recommends uh, basically doing the same thing. Just turn your, your quantitative feature into a qualitative feature by using the cut, you know, uh, by stratifying the data over intervals and doing the same thing. And so when you look at is plots like this from figure 11.4 in the book, if your log hazard for the two uh, levels of the feature are just offset or approximately offset by a constant, then you're you're good, right? This is a proportional hazard. If they're like this and cross, that's no bueno. You can't assume proportional hazard. And I don't know what you do because we don't have tools for that, but you know, I guess there are tools out there for handling that. So now we talk about the Cox's proportional hazard model. And the issue we have is that H zero T is completely arbitrary. I guess what well, one thing we could do is not make it arbitrary. We could parameterize it somehow and then plug it into a likelihood thing, but that's not what we're going to do here. Uh, the book now abandons the whole likelihood <laughs> business, which after spending quite a bit of time building it up, is kind of strange to me that we just suddenly decided to say goodbye to the, <laughs> the likelihood function. And uh, we're just going to forget about that. And, uh, but Cox discovered a way to call to this in 1972 to estimate these parameters beta without having to know H is zero. And he does that by using this partial likelihood method, which involves ratios of uh, the hazard function. So the H zeros cancel out. The details of that are in the text. And I, I, I read through it. I seem to understand when I read it, but it kind of fell out of my head again already how it works. But if there's questions, we can probably dig into it if you want to. But um, the point is like most of these things, all we really need to do is uh, use a library function. Use this Cox pH proportional hazard. Again, put our model in. Here it is just for using sex again, right? And we can do the fit and it comes back and says, oh, here's the coefficient. And, and here's the exponential of the coefficient, which you'd like to know because remember the model is using the exponential of the linear 
uh, regression. And also gives us the uh, p value for that, right? Again, this is the same p value we got from the log rank test, so that's satisfying that we, again, we say, okay, it's not very um, uh, significant effect on the sex. And there's some other tests that does here as well. Oh, here's a log rank text actually. This is rounded. I think the text talks, or the lab t talks about how to get these unrounded. I forgot to do that part. Um, now, okay, that's fine. Let's do some more parameters. Um, let's add in all the parameters. Why not? I guess we could have used a dot here, but um, we didn't. And this is what we get here. Here's all the different coefficients. The for the diagnosis, the baseline, I think, or the baseline is men, meningioma, meningioma, meningioma. I don't know how you pronounce that. Men, I'm not a doctor. Well, not that kind. Meningioma. I don't know. Anyway, that's the baseline. And we can see that there is a significant uh, effect from her being diagnosed with whatever that is, right? HG glioma. Boy, somebody's going to watch this video and, and be rolling over in laughter. Anyway. Um, that seems very significant and the risk is about eight times the risk uh versus the all we know now by the way it's important we only knew relative risk here because we don't actually have the survival curve yet but relative risk is eight times higher which is sometimes all you really want to know and mm. again that's just from this coefficient here and then either the, either the coefficient is whoops sorry here it is 2.15 e to the 2.5 is just given here in this column you don't have to actually do this math it's the outputs there um, so that's bad. Um, the only other really predict significant predictor is the KI, the um, Karnofsky index, again associated with lower risk for having higher scores, which means you have more cognitive ability. Um, the, the risk is, is slightly less, uh, I guess, but still significant, 6% less, I guess is how you'd interpret that. Well, per index, right, per index level. So. That's pretty significant then, right? So that means, yeah, if you're if you're scored well in that cognitive test, you're much likely to survive um, longer. And that makes sense, right? Because that means the damage was probably not as severe to your brain, I presume. Uh, let's see what else we gotta talk about. Wow, am I talking too fast again? Probably, we're, moving, we're cooking right through this. <laughs> you guys should interrupt me more, ask more questions, make me work harder. Okay, so one last thing to talk about here is the survival curves. I said before that uh, the uh, proportional model cancels out the, the baseline survival curve, but it is possible to plot these, to get these curves out of the library functions. They use some methods which are beyond the scope of the book apparently to do that, but you can plot them like here it is the survival curves for the different um, diagnosis, for example. And again, the most significant one is the HG glioma, which is very highly... Uh, associated with a much faster, much shorter lifespan. Um, yeah, and the lab goes, to, I'm not gonna talk through all this R code, but the lab, this is from the lab and you get a chance to do that when the time comes. We can ask questions if you want to. Uh, let's see, oh yeah, there's something called a Breslow estimator. This method. I tried to figure this out, like, how does it do that? I wanna know. And you look in the documentation, it mentions some Breslow estimator, which I looked at that. It turns out it's like some kind of comment on a paper, the original paper by Cox in 1972, this guy Breslow made about how to do this. And that's about as far as my my uh, my investigation went. But there's some breadcrumbs to anybody else who wants to continue down that, that path. I think I just had other things to think about. It wasn't easy, let's put it that way. So I like easy things. So I'm like, okay, never mind. Moving on. But you don't have to worry about it in some in many ways because it just will do it for you. The, the, the library will do it for you. I think if I were to actually have to do some analysis of this kind of data, I would want to know how it really works. But I don't have to right now, so I'm, I'm going to put that put a pin in that and come back to it sometime later. Now, the last section of this chapter was additional topics, which is really more like, hey, here's more breadcrumbs you could follow. Uh, one was, you know, you can add penalty functions to them. It's very similar to the way it works in uh, all the regression we've done before. You can do uh, lasso, you can do ridge regression. You just have to add some penalty function to it. And again, you don't have to do it. You just tell the library function, hey, I want you to put a lasso on this uh, and it will do it. I didn't work through any of that. I don't know if the lab does. I think the lab doesn't do this. 
then they talk also about area of the curve for survival analysis, but I didn't really dig too far into that section of the book. And so I don't have much to say about that. Anybody doesn't want to have any comments about that particular section, please jump in. Uh, and finally, they talked about choice of time scale, which we talked about a little bit ourselves in time dependent covariance, which we also talked a little bit, you know, the, the, the proportional hazard model readily adapts to time dependent covariance, it turns out. And then finally, this I thought was kind of interesting, like kind of a little short paragraph, which just says that there is a way of doing this thing with trees, which I've recently become really interested in trees. So it might, that might be something I might look at at some point more uh, in more detail. Like a decision tree it's kind so, of thing? Yeah, decision tree, you know, including forest and boosting and all the rest can be put mm. in this kind of thing. That's interesting. They don't say how, it just says can be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They don't, they don't even give a reference. So, so with the, <laughs> they, it's a matter of Googling. With the time dependent covariates, um, is that about like estimating an effect at different points in the survival curve, like of the different covariates or what does that, what does that mean? Uh, a time dependent covariates? It's just, it's just that the, the, yeah, it's just different uh, beta depending on how much time has elapsed. I see. So, right? okay. yeah. Currently, the betas are all constant. And all the time dependence is in the age zero, but it's possible to have a time dependent yeah. area. Because I was wondering about uh, that actually with yeah. the, I think when we were talking about log rank, because it seems like that's like a. Oh, not, not the beta, I'm sorry. Not the. Yeah. It's the predictors, not the slopes. I'm sorry. It's the predictors that can change yeah. the function as a function of time, which is exactly what you were talking about. Yeah. The kind of thing you were talking about. Yeah. Um, but I was also like, I was also wondering, like, um, like with the log rank test, for instance, like there's, you just get kind of one statistic for a curve to comparing two curves. And, um, and I was just like, like, I feel like in some cases you might want to know, like for the first, you know, 30 days, is there a significant difference? And then from 30 to 60 days, is there a significant difference? And 60 to 90 days and 90 to 120, you know? Um, um, yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Uh, it, I did misspeak a little bit. It's not the betas. It's not the slopes. It's actually the the covariates, the variables that right uh, that depend can depend on time. Right now they're just constants, right? So there's like a, the the persons that the yes the time of death was seven days and it's male and he had this kind of surgery uh, or whatever. But we could yeah, actually yeah. have a time dependent predictor, which would right. would address the issue we were talking about earlier, where there's some kind of event that happened in calendar time event that happened yeah. during the. During like for the thing, like so. that um that the the brain cancer data like that cognitive cognitive test if that was re-administered every three weeks or something um there you go that's a good example yeah. they, they use the example of blood yeah. pressure but in the in the book but yeah same thing yeah yeah and so yeah, then you I imagine like you could have more kind of, data set and some kind of like lag lagged indicators and things like that yeah Yeah, that's something definitely to dig into. It seems like this is there's a lot more. In my conclusions, I say, hey, this is just an introduction, and we learned a few tools, but it really does seem like there's a lot more out there to learn on this, right? And that if you really had an actual problem with this, I would almost guarantee you that I'd be spending a lot of time reading papers or looking at other books that specifically just talk only about survival analysis. I feel like it's a deep, deep subject. It's like deep learning was too, right? We didn't really learn to do deep learning. We learned about deep learning, <laughs> right? Yeah. And yeah. even though we did some examples in the lab, but here we didn't really learn how to do survival analysis. We learned about it, which is huge for me because I actually did not know about it at all. I didn't realize it was a separate thing. I was just using the same old regression tool that I use for everything else. You know, it's just another column, right? Why? You know, the time. It's another, it's a, you know, it's a result, you know? Yeah. So, and Learning you said you need to treat a special yeah. already is 100% of what I needed to know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess like, so, so is it special, even if you don't have any censoring, is it, it's still special beyond that, right? From, like, I don't know. I wondered about that because, yeah. like I said before, like if it, you don't have any, I mean, there's always going to be censoring in the sense the study ends, but that's okay, I think, right? Um, we just don't have any value in that column, I guess, or something, but. 
Yeah. It seems like the key thing that makes it really weird is if you have early censoring, you know, if you have censored data before the study ends, that really trick makes things tricky. Like, it seems to me the survival curve is easy to estimate if you didn't have that censoring. If all the censoring just happened at the end, in other words, nobody yeah. ever dropped out of your study or whatever, it seems like that would be a, a, lot, of hard, a lot easier. Yeah. It, yeah, in a weird way. But I also think like... one of the... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, but the other key aspect is the fact that these times are, are open-ended. And so no matter how long you do your study for, you have the potential for censoring at the end. So it does make a little different from that point of view. But I still think you could do like maybe a Poisson regression or something if, if you didn't have any early censoring. I'm not sure about that, though. I don't know. <laughs> That's something I need to think about more carefully. But So like if you did have like, you know, a uh, right censored participant like towards the you know who who got let's say they got diagnosed with brain cancer a week before the study ended or something and then they were there for a week yeah. um you could get a prediction out of that that says that gives an estimate of their individual survival curve is that what is that what the output would be like if you get an observation a new observation like that and um and they're like right censored, like, like what do you like? What do you get out of them? You know, um, I would guess, right? Like some kind of estimate of how long to to survive. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, I'm not quite sure I followed everything you were just saying, but uh -huh. it makes sense. I wonder then also like. Um sort of following up on what Kevin was saying. So if you have something like that, right, where you're testing like the efficacy of a drug on survival times, like for people that just dropped out of your study, do you just remove them from the analysis? No. I think no, they're they right. just become censored because you know that they, yeah, they're right, they're censored, they're right censored. You just, that's the key thing, right? So you just mark that status variable one, you know that they, you know, that they survived up to that time or whatever the event you're looking at there. That's data. Yeah. That's still useful to know. But would that tell you anything S. about the yeah. efficacy of your? I guess that they survive somehow, right? But uh, I guess you wouldn't know. Yeah, up until that point. Yeah. Up until that point, yeah. And the cool thing about these techniques that are based on the rates, it automatically takes care of that. Um, takes care of that censoring for you in some sense. <laughs> Right, because like this cumulative probability of like each step, what those what those yeah. rates are into the past, like in your data set, um, it kind of reminds me of in a in a weird way, like the um, the rolling cross validation kind of approach to time series data, where you're like you like train up until a point, and then you evaluate the next point, and then you train up until that point and then you evaluate the next point and you like kind of do that over and over again like this like sliding window kind of thing um it it reminds me of that a little bit well i mean i don't know about that but it sounds cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah just i was just saying that like, huh. like with with like these with the um like that risk like ratio right like it's like up until that point who's still who's still you know who's still at risk who dies at that at that mo at that time and then and then you do it for the next point and the next point and the next point it's kind of like a similar like windowed idea um, now but, yeah. oops. That's okay. but it also does seem like interesting as a as a way to when you do have dropouts as a way to um you know save save some data or like some value get some value out of data even though um even though you don't have a full sample for some people yeah the only times i've I ever done really kind of data analysis before i just did what you said i just dropped out that data i said well that guy you know would and again it was right left sensor but the same idea of like i don't know so i was just uh, too bad mm -hmm. i can't do anything about that I just want to use that customer, <laughs> which means, you know, which is a shame because I know there's good data in there, but now I at least have some idea that there is a way to do it. And for left sensory, I guess I have to go do some research, but I'm not doing that analysis anymore. So I'm not worried about it right now. 
Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking yeah. like um I used to I used to be in education research, uh doing like studies in schools and you would have kids in the middle of the study who like um like who would just collect data throughout the semester throughout throughout the school year and then like they would do quizzes and you know whatever every few weeks and then or some assessment or they use the tool that we're giving them and then they would like change school districts or um, mm -hmm. change classrooms and not be part of the study anymore um, and I never thought that like you could uh, you know still use that data somehow um, it's like that's really really neat I would have it would have changed how I approached some of that work um, Yeah, yeah, here's a, a dumb question, Kevin. What would the data tell you? I mean, it, yeah, I don't know. Like, um, I guess in that case, though, it's not really about like dropping out or not dropping out or mm -hmm. like, it, or it's not, there isn't really like a analogy to survival in that case. So I don't mm -hmm. know if I could actually use this for that. Um, like, it's like, it's like they're, surviving in the study but like the outcome isn't survival you know yeah, yeah um like i guess your outcome needs to be survival like because in survival case it just tells you like uh, you know that person lived in the study at least that long mm -hmm. you know and that's all it tells you but that is information you know it's like it's more than one it's more than two it's more than three it's more than four it's more than at least up until the moment they dropped out, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So Ron, like, would you do your, okay, that, so work, that work you had done pr previously? Is that, do you have ideas about what you would have done using these methods or would you have done anything differently? Uh, for, for sure, I would have definitely not thrown out the data, um, yeah. you know, of the people that were censored in the middle of the, the, um, my, the period of time that I had data for. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a big difference. There's a lot of customers and that would help improve my estimates by a lot, I assume. I, now, I, I guess I would have, to, again, like I said, I would feel like I would have to go investigate how to do that exactly better. I don't mm -hmm. think I would trust just throwing it into our library functions and um, you know, I like to see how things work. That's just my nature. Yeah. yeah. Even if I don't understand it completely, I just like to kind of know enough. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, like I said, I'm really, this book has been great for introducing me to things that I had never known about that even existed before um, for some reason. I mean, this is a great thing about this book, right? So like the tree-based methods. I didn't, didn't know about those, and I certainly didn't know about uh, support vector machines, and I didn't know there's these cool tools for dealing with uh, time uh, survival analysis, so. Yeah, it was definitely a lot something more else intricate. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, because I've, I've done yeah. um, and, you know, heard about these uh, Kaplan-Meier curves, because I took a, like, biology of cancer class, and so those curves were all over the place, but I'm like, oh, okay, there's a lot more to this that, you know, than just like the Kaplan Meyer curve. Um, yeah. So it, yeah, it, like you're saying, it's very interesting to learn about like the different, like the reasons why you do this and what you can get out of like even the censored data, like or people that are dropping out of a study. So now what did you guys want to do next week then? Do you want to go off, do the rest of the lab and then maybe do some exercises and talk about it next week? We don't necessarily have to have a long session next week, but um, we can definitely do that. Um, talk through some of these. I'm not sure which one of these exercises I'm going to do. I'll do some of them though. Yeah, oh, I, know we said we, well, I know we said we could like, you know, use our discretion about what we wanted to do exercises for. I. I would love to do these exercises for this chapter, um, you know, and I think just choosing whichever ones you have time for are most interesting to you, uh, I think is a good, fine approach. All right. So, yeah, let's do that. And then we'll reconvene next week and talk about it and uh, see yeah. what we learned. Sounds good. Can I ask yep. a unrelated question about our packages and updating R? Of course. Um, what's the easiest way to just update my version of R 
and then not lose all of my packages because I have a lot of different projects. I don't know. Is there a way? Like how you guys I'm do kind it? Of a, yeah. Um, like you now have to reinstall everything, I think. Well, I, I'm running R411, I think. Mm -hmm. And it always gives me warning messages. And then for one of the book clubs, there are certain packages I cannot install because it's not happy with like the bioconductor version of them. And so I'm like, yeah, I probably okay. should update then the the version of R. Yeah. So that I can I think just you'll... I think you, no matter what, you'll, you'll mm -hmm. still have to reinstall your packages. Um, okay. Since they were installed for yeah, a different cool. version, I think. But yeah, I mean, okay. to at least at least make sure you have them. Um, a good idea is to use like um, like to have them in a like a, a, a lock file with like R. Have you ever used R R uh, M? Yes, I have that for okay. most of my projects. So oh, I'm like, okay. at least okay. I did that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's really good uh, to have, I think. Um, but now that but you already have it, so <laughs> yeah. I, I don't okay. I don't think there's like a workaround. I think I think for a different software version of R, like a different release version, you just mm -hmm. kind of have to reinstall stuff. But um, okay. okay. I just wanted to make sure before I go ahead and then I'm like, oh no, there was a way um so okay have you guys ever um heard because this is something i heard like a while back someone um when they switched versions of r or updated it then it gave them problems with i guess it was certain packages that either just um they were in the middle of an analysis and now it was just not working properly i i don't know the details of it but can something like that happen like it doesn't play well with either older things or somehow makes it work differently? Um, well, I, I don't know. I guess it, okay. it's a hard, hard question. Like the, I mean, there isn't much changing in terms of the base R syntax, mm -hmm. right? Like, um, so, you know, except for adding things like the, like the native pipe in 4.2 right right um, okay so i don't think like from a syntax perspective the mm -hmm. base stuff should matter i just wonder like um i don't know how it works like are there some packages where if you even if you specify like a package version and then you install mm -hmm. it on r 4.2 would that would it not work with a certain i think some packages might in some package versions might require a higher version of r mm -hmm. you know um so in those cases like if you're in re installing a new version of that package they could change like the api or you know the function names or whatever and kind of like break your code um i see okay maybe uh, yeah so i i'm sorry possible. i don't remember yeah. exactly what that person said you know and i was so so new at the time that i'm like i don't even know what you're talking about other than i should be scared <laughs> to upgrade mm -hmm. r so yeah um, okay that actually helps i mean usually do for you know, look at some point you're gonna get at some point you're gonna end up with a new computer and have to reinstall this stuff mm -hmm. anyway mm -hmm. so it's, it's worth mm -hmm. making it's worth making sure everything works <laughs> I yeah yeah, yeah. I, it's, it's easy I, I think in like my i mostly work with python i do only a little bit of r but with Python, mm -hmm. it's the same thing. I find that things can be fragile, and if things start getting fragile, it's something to worry about. And try to make them not fragile because eventually that fragility is going to bite you hard yeah. <laughs> when you have to redo yeah. everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's not by choice. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. No, I, I think I'm, I'm slowly um, getting because sometimes I'm just like, oh, I'll just keep doing this like this for a little bit, and then it's, you know, it just gets worse and worse yeah. and worse, yeah. and then like, yeah, okay. We all do that. We all do that. Just we, sometimes you just have to take a step back and like go into a different mode. You know, like today I'm going to yeah. go into yeah, yeah, yeah. gardening. It's like a gardening. Do some trimming of gardening and get rid of the weeds in your, <laughs> in your installation. I guess so. Or like you know, cleaning the house or whatnot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You look, yeah. Yeah. But it sounds like kind of the, you've done your due diligence with R R M. You know and. Um, and I, I don't know how much more you can do. I mean, uh, other yeah. than like having 
some kind of a virtual environment where you you can have one version of R running there and another environment where you're running a different version, and you, but it gets complicated if you're doing something. Yeah, no, I, I thought about that because, uh, you know, someone had mentioned it and I was like, I think that's beyond my capacity at the moment and I'm just going to yeah. mess it up by doing that. So might as well, you know, just take the time now, yeah, to, up, you know, upgrade it and then reinstall everything properly. At least I read about the RN, which I'm happy about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, at least with that, like, you know, you're going to end up with the same, it's going to at least try to install the same packages that you had. Um, yeah, 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 exactly. Um, but are you doing, but you have that by project too, right? You said, um, yes, um, yeah. generally, other than my very old projects, which a lot of them are published, so I'm not super concerned about that. Um, but I, I do have one that is currently, you know, still like in production. And I'm like, I just didn't want to change something that then would, change, you know, make the analysis not work in some way. But I, I don't think that's the case because the analysis was done elsewhere and I'm just plotting things. So, yeah, I mean, that's yeah. why like that's I feel like in order to really fully control that stuff, like mm -hmm. you would need like a Docker or something to say like. Right. This operating system, this version of R, these packages mm -hmm. with these versions, it works here. I can do it there. I can reproduce it. Um, mm -hmm. But honestly, if you change any of those variables, it could change how the analysis runs. You know. And yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, you know. that is true. Cool. Well, thank you guys for your advice. Yeah. That helps. Right. It makes me you more feel. confident about proceeding. Sure. All yeah, right. Getting right, we'll base, see you guys. Oops. Getting the base pipe is worth it. So <laughs> I got the base pipe. I was excited. Oh yeah, yeah. All of a sudden the other pipe looks old. And I'm like, <laughs> it's so weird. It's almost like you know, fashion choices. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. Okay. See you guys All right. next time. All right, guys. Thanks, see you. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, guys. All right, bye.